welcome to week three of this series that we've, that we've called Likeable. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've discovered that people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and he liked them too. And I mean, how, how cool is that? Jesus liked people who were nothing like him, and he liked them because they were who he came to this world for. I mean, Jesus himself said that the entire reason that God sent him was to seek and to save those who were lost, those who have a broken relationship with holy creator God because of their violation of sin against him. And that's you and me and every single person. Jesus liked people who were nothing like him because they are who he came to this world for. And people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus because of how they perceived him. The, the way that Jesus talked, acted, responded, interacted with people who were nothing like him, lost people like you and me, the, the, the way that, the way that uh, they perceived Jesus made them know that they, that they didn't just like him, they made them know that, that he liked them, and it made them want to know him. So the question that we've been kind of confronting throughout the series is, how do people who don't follow Jesus, people who have said no to God, no to Jesus, no to the church, no to us, no to what we believe, who are skeptical of all this, how do people who don't follow Jesus perceive those of us who claim that we do? And it's an important question because before Jesus physically left this earth, after, his, after he rose from the grave and right before he physically ascended, right before Jesus physically left this earth, he called us, his church, his followers, to carry on his mission of seeking and saving those who were lost by sharing the good news of his love, forgiveness, mercy, truth, grace, hope, and peace with them. This is not just something we do. It's actually who we're called to be. It's who we are. Jesus and the writers of the New Testament tell us that as followers of Christ, as people who have put our faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of our sins and leader of our life, that we are now the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are Christ's ambassadors sent on a mission to draw the world to God. And what that means for you if you're a follower of Christ is that you can't follow Jesus without carrying on Jesus' mission. And you aren't following Jesus if you aren't influencing people towards Jesus. So let me ask you again. How do people perceive those of us who claim to be followers of Christ? You and me. And it's an important question because perception matters. It matters because perception impacts likability. Likability impacts relationship. I mean, if someone doesn't like you, they don't want to have a relationship with you. And that's a really big deal because relationship impacts influence because influence happens within the context of relationship. And the reality is that you don't have to look very hard to discover is that the way many people perceive those of us who claim to follow Jesus is making us very unlikable. And not only is that preventing people from wanting to know us, it's also preventing many people from wanting to know the person whom we say we follow, Jesus. So we can't be okay with this. We must do everything we can to change people's negative perceptions of us because we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are Christ's ambassadors. So that's what we're attempting to do throughout this series. Throughout this four-week series, we're looking at four common negative perceptions people have with followers of Christ and identifying some next-step solutions for how to change those negative perceptions. The first negative perception we looked at the first week is that we're sheltered. The second negative perception that we talked about last week is that we're hypocritical. The third negative perception that we're going to look at this week that people have with those, those of us who are followers of Christ is a really convicting one to talk about. And it's that where judgmental. Today should be fun. <laughs> now, before I move on any further, we need to define what do we mean by judgmental, because there's a lot of different ways to define this word. Here's the definition I'm going to use for our discussion today. An attitude, word, or posture towards someone that makes them feel criticized, put down, excluded, or marginalized. Now, real quick, let me be honest. I want you, everyone, to raise your hand if you have ever felt judged by a person who claims to be a follower of Christ. If you ever felt judged by a person who claims to be a follower of Christ, raise your hand. All right, the entire room. So basically what that's saying is we even perceive each other as judgmental. And I know what you're going to say is, well, maybe they are, maybe they are, this guy next to me for sure is, but I'm not, like I'm not, I mean, none of us think that we're the judgmental ones. But it doesn't matter if you think you are or not. What matters is what's perceived about us. And in a recent study, a recent study revealed that 87% of people outside the church, 87%, that's 9 out of 10 people, 
87% of people outside the church describe Christians as ju judgmental. To put that in practical terms, that means the moment that someone at work, in your neighborhood, in your class, on your team, finds out that you're a follower of Christ, chances are they'll think of you as being judgmental. Like it or not, this is what we're known for most. What, like it or not, what we're mo known for most is not love, it's not grace, it's not hope. It's being judgmental. Now, some of you aren't going to like what I have to say next, but I, like, I, I love you enough to say it. The reason we're perceived as being judgmental is because so often we are being judgmental. Nine out of ten people perceive us as judgmental because so often you and I are being judgmental. None of us want to be judgmental. I mean, we hate it when people are being judgmental toward us. So the question is, why? Like, if we don't want to be judgmental, then why are we being? Like, what causes us to be? And you know this to be true. Being judgmental starts by making a judgment. Being judgmental starts by making a judgment. And the judgment that we have made about people is that you are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. Now, listen, this is so important. According to our Heavenly Father, according to Jesus, according to the writers of the New Testament, this judgment is true. It's true about them, it's true about you, and it's true about me. Every person is a sinner. Every person has a broken relationship with Holy Creator God because of their violation of sin against Him. And that's why every person is in desperate need of a Savior, someone to atone for their sins, save them from their penalty of sin, forgive us for our sins, and restore and redeem and reconcile our broken relationship with our Heavenly Father in this life and the next. That's what we believe Jesus came to, this, came to the earth for. That's what we believe Jesus died on the cross for, and that's what we believe Jesus rose from the grave to do for us and prove that only he can do for us. Our judgment is that you, like me, are a sinner in desperate need of a Savior and that Jesus alone is that Savior. And we believe that that judgment is true. But there is a big difference between making a judgment and being judgmental. And unfortunately, this true judgment has oftentimes fueled a judgmental approach. Oftentimes, this true judgment has fueled attitudes and postures and words toward people that have made them feel criticized, put down, excluded, and marginalized. A phrase that many people, that many of you have, many people have adopted that you've probably heard that's, by the way, nowhere in the Bible is this. Love the sinner and hate the sin. You've probably heard this at some point in time. Love the sinner and hate the sin. But if we're being honest, come on, let's be honest. Oftentimes, we don't focus on loving the sinner nearly as much as we do on communicating how much you and God are, are, are hate, hate and are against that particular sin. And it sounds like, hey, what you're doing is a sin. And God hates it. You're breaking God's laws and you're breaking God's commands and you better turn from that sin or you're going to burn in hell. You need to repent of that sin right now and get, so you can get right with God or you're going to face the wrath of God. I'm right, but because of your sin, you aren't and you can't be until you repent of that particular sin. Now, you may not say those exact words, but so often that's what our attitude and that's what our posture communicates. Guys, come on, let's, be, let's just be honest with ourselves. Oftentimes, we deserve the label judgmental. And how do you think that makes people feel? And some of you are going, I don't care how it makes them feel. They, know that need, they need to know the truth and how wrong they are. And if they perceive me as being judgmental, it simply means because I stood my ground against sin. <laughs> well, how is that approach working for you? Anyone repenting? Any of you positively influencing anyone for Jesus through that? And the answer is no. And why? Because very few people get judged into life change. Very few people get judged into life change. The reason we're perceived as being judgmental is because so often our approach is judgmental. Our attitudes and words and postures toward people make them feel criticized, put down, excluded, marginalized by us and our Heavenly Father, and nothing good comes from it. See, the more judgmental we are, the more unlikable we are. 
And you know this to be true because you've never liked someone that you felt judged by. I mean, how do you perceive be- people who are being judgmental towards you? You perceive them closed-minded, negative, stressful to be around, unaccepting, critical, always thinking they're right, that, that they have a superiority complex. That makes them very unlikable to you, doesn't it? The presence of judgment almost always guarantees the absence of love, which inevitably kills the relationship because we become very unlikable. We become very unlikable because they perceive us as people who don't like them. And when people perceive us as being judgmental, they perceive us as people who hate the sin and the sinner. Them. Being judgmental makes us unlikable, but the negative outcomes are much bigger and way more serious than that for others and for you. The more judgmental we are, the more we push people away from the Savior that they desperately need. Being judgmental prevents people from knowing and experiencing God's love and grace for them. When people feel judged by Christ's ambassadors, you and me, they assume Jesus hates them and is against them. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Jesus loved you and loved them enough to die for them. You can judge a person right out of a saving relationship with Jesus. The more judgmental we are, the more prideful we become. And pride makes us feel superior to people. And you don't want to be filled with pride because, according to the writers of the New Testament, God opposes the proud. The more judgmental we are, the more severely we will be judged by the judge. At least according to Jesus when he said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. As followers of Christ, we are called to share the good news of Jesus' love, forgiveness, truth, mercy, grace, salvation, hope, peace with people who are in desperate need of a Savior. Being judgmental has never worked, and it will never work. As the salt of the earth, as the light of the world, as Christ's ambassadors, we got to change our approach. So what's the best approach? What's the most effective approach? Well, if God had had an approach, I'm pretty sure his approach would probably be the most effective. So does God have an approach? And he absolutely does. And the Apostle Paul told us what that approach is in Romans 2. And guys, this is so key. Lean into this. God's kindness. God's kindness. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Because of God's great love, He desires for every person to repent. Here's what repent means. Repent means to turn turn from something we've been following towards someone or something else. Well, we all turned our backs on holy creator God and broke our relationship with him that he created us for because of our violation of sin against him. God desires that every person turns back to him through faith in Jesus. By asking Jesus to be the forgiver of our sins and the leader of our life. Saying, Jesus, I want to follow you now. Our sin is such a violation against Holy Creator God. His will for us, his created intent for us. That his approach, God's approach with us should be wrath. God's approach with us should be shame and judgment and guilt. And let me tell you what. He would choose that approach with us if he thought that was the most impactful approach for us to repent. But instead, our all-knowing and and all-powerful God thinks his kindness is the best approach to lead us to repentance. So let me ask you a very convicting question. Do you think you know better than God? Every time we're being judgmental, we're pridefully saying, God, my ways are better and my ways are more effective than yours. But at the end of the day, our ways ain't working. But what does God's kindness look like? 
What is God's kindness? What does his kindness look like? Well, Jesus embodied it perfectly. And, and John, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, explains how. He says, the word, referring to Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Basically, John's saying he was God in a bod. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father. And here it is, full of grace and truth. Jesus embodied the kindness of God that leads to repentance because he was full of both grace and truth. Grace, unconditionally and excessively giving people what they don't deserve. God's mercy, forgiveness, acceptance. Truth, knowing and unapologetically communicating God's holy, righteous, perfect truth. Jesus was not the balance of grace and truth. He was the fullness of both at the same time all the time. That's what the kindness of God that leads to repentance looks like because that's what perfect love is. The Apostle Paul defined love. And one of the ways he defined love is he said, love is kind. People aren't judged into a loving relationship with Jesus. They aren't judged into a saving relationship with Jesus. They're loved into it. Love is not love without grace. And love is not love without truth. Because the opposite of truth are lies. And perfect love never lies. Or intentionally leads people away from God's truth. Jesus fronted God's loving kindness perfectly and fully, especially with people who were considered unacceptable sinners. He didn't do it by balancing grace and truth, but by walking in the fullness of both all the time at the same time. Jesus walked in the fullness of both because the fullness of God's grace is needed for God's truth to be heard, and the fullness of God's truth is needed for God's grace to be felt and known and experienced. What we naturally want to do is turn grace or truth up and down. And we go, oh, some more truth is needed here, so i got to turn grace down. Or some more grace is needed here, so i got to water down truth. That's not love. And you're lying to yourself if you do either and you say you love them. That's not the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Walking in the fullness of grace and truth, it's hard and it's messy. And yet Jesus did it perfectly. And one of the many examples is of which, when he did is recorded in John 8. Leading up to John 8, Jesus is gaining popularity amongst the Jews because of who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and, and because of all the miracles that he was performing. The legalistic Jewish religious leaders, they're fed up with Jesus because the things he did and said seem to contradict the laws and commands that God gave the Jewish people in their Hebrew scriptures that we call the Old Testament. Many of the religious leaders viewed Jesus as a lunatic. Other view, others viewed him as a liar. Most of them viewed him as an absolute heretic. And they, so they would try to discredit Jesus, and they've been doing it without success, and they're becoming ex extremely frustrated. And then one day they see Jesus preaching in the, temp in the Jewish temple, and they try to set a trap for him. Verse 2, at dawn, he, Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. So this crowd of Jewish people gathered around Jesus and he starts preaching and then all of a sudden chaos breaks out. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, those are the legalistic Jewish religious leaders that we talked about last week. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law is Moses, and that was the phrase they used to describe their 600 plus laws and commands in their Hebrew scriptures. In the, law, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say, Jesus? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. According to the Mosaic law, any Jew who committed the sin of adultery could be stoned. The Jewish religious leaders knew this. The Jewish crowd knew this. The Jewish woman knew this. And Jewish Jesus knew this. So right in the middle of Jesus preaching, these Jewish leaders bust in and interrupt him. And they ask Jesus what he thinks should happen to this woman. Not because they really wanted to know what he taught or what he thought, but because they wanted to see if Jesus would say something that would contradict the Hebrew scriptures so they could accuse him of heresy. Now, I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here and say what the Pharisees were putting this woman through was probably not what the kindness of God looks like. But they go on and describing her sin. And as they did, the Jewish crowd that just a moment ago was listening to Jesus started picking up rocks to stone her. 
In typical Jesus fashion, he didn't respond how anyone would expect him to. As a matter of fact, he didn't respond at all. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. <laughs> it's as if Jesus took a time out. Why? Well, not to think about what he was going to say. I mean, he's God. He knows what he's going to say. And maybe, listen, I'm just reading between the lines here, maybe he took that little time out to let the tension rise inside of everyone before he said what he knew he was going to say. Now, before we discover what he says, I want you real quick to put yourself in the woman's shoes, in that woman's shoes. She knew the truth. She knew she was living in sin, and now she was being judged by everyone for it. How do you think she felt as she looked at everyone with their judgmental stones in their hands through her tear-filled eyes? Do you think in that moment she was inspired to change? Or do you think she was shame-filled, put down, marginalized, embarrassed, guilty? Can you relate to that woman? You ever felt judged like that before? If so, you need to hear what Jesus said to her in just a moment. But I also want you to put yourself in the crowd's shoes. They knew the truth. They knew she was living in sin. And they knew how God viewed her sin. But they didn't believe that the kindness of God leads to repentance. They thought the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the shame of God did. So they picked up the rocks to stone and condemn her. We're going to show you how wrong you are. We're going to judge you with these stones until you repent of that sin. And the longer Jesus stayed quiet, the tighter they gripped those rocks, and the more rage and judgment and disgust and tension they felt toward this woman. And maybe you're like one of the people in the crowd, holding on to a rock of condemning judgment and ready to throw it at them until they repent of that sin. If that's you, you need to pay attention to what Jesus said to them next. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, and then Jesus puts the, fullness, the, put, puts the fullness of grace and truth on display for everyone there, starting with the crowd. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. In that moment, Jesus embodied the kindness of God with the crowd who were holding those rocks. Basically saying, the truth, the truth is that you are, aren't without sin either. The truth is that you deserve God's judgment and wrath too. But instead, right now, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. Grace, mercy, and patience. And I'm going to offer you a little for, for the forgiveness right now as well. And then Jesus bent down and took another time out. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the women Still standing there. After Jesus went quiet again, the Jewish crowd looked at the rocks they were holding in their hands. And in that moment, they knew they were guilty for their sin of condemning, just as guilty for their sin of condemning judgment as she was for her sin. And in that moment, maybe for the first time in their life, they knew the truth that they also deserved God's wrath. But instead, they'd experienced God's grace. So one by one, they dropped the rocks, and they turned and walked away. Jesus' kindness led to their repentance. Is that you today? You holding a judgmental rock? Is your attitudes, words, and posture toward people making them feel criticized, put down, excluded, or marginalized? If so, Jesus would say the same thing to you that he said to the crowd that day. Well, the crowd there was not alone in experiencing the kindness of God. After everyone had gone, and it was only Jesus and the woman left standing there, verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. As a Jewish woman, she know God's truth. And that she deserved to be contend, condemned. And if Jesus was who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Savior, she knew that Jesus was the only one there that day who could actually judge her. But instead, Jesus embodied the fullness of grace and truth. I do not condemn you. Instead, I'm here to give you what you don't deserve. Love, mercy. I'm here to offer you forgiveness. Notice. 
He didn't offer that to her after she repented, but before, because the kindness of God is intended to lead you to repentance. Now imagine, imagine how she must have felt to be offered such undeserved grace. And just a moment ago, she was surrounded by people with rocks ready to stone her. Imagine how much shame and guilt was lifted off her shoulders in that moment. Imagine how much has probably stirred her heart to want to follow Jesus from that point forward. And I believe in that moment, she accepted God's forgiveness for her by putting her faith in Jesus. And I believe she did because I don't believe Jesus would have said what he said next if she hadn't. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Now that you've accepted my love and my grace and my mercy and my forgiveness for you, now that you've accepted that for you, turn from your sin. And now follow me. John John didn't record what this woman did next because he didn't need to. He's assuming we know she chose to follow Jesus because if she hadn't, it would be an an anticlimactic story not worth telling. She put her faith in Jesus and she chose to follow him because she had a radical encounter with the kindness of God embodied in the person of Jesus. And it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Jesus embodied the kindness of God that leads to repentance by walking in the fullness of grace and truth. He didn't balance grace and truth. He walked in the fullness of both at the same time, all the time. Listen, you got to understand, Jesus never changed. He never compromised. He never lowered. He never watered, the de- watered down the truth about sin. He had such a high standard of sin. He's such a high standard of obedience that he got on a cross and died for it. He never watered it down or lowered it. Jesus could have implemented a judgmental approach that we so often do with this woman because of this high view. You're breaking God's commands and you're breaking God's laws and God hates it. You need to turn from that sin or you're going to burn in hell. You need to repent of that sin to get right with God or you're going to face the wrath of God. But Jesus had a different approach. He engaged relationally with her in the fullness of grace, I do not condemn you, and in the fullness of truth. Now, now, leave your life of sin. That's what the kindness of God that leads to repentance looks like because that's what perfect love is. And the perfect love of God displayed through Jesus is what transforms hearts and minds and lives and eternities. Jesus embodied the kindness of God that leads to repentance by walking in the fullness of grace and truth. And as people who are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, he calls us to do the same. We will never be able to effectively share the love, the truth, the forgiveness, the mercy, the grace, the salvation, the hope, the peace of Jesus with people who are in need of Jesus through a judgmental approach because being judgmental kills what only kindness can do. Being judgmental, being judgmental kills what only kindness to do. Being judgmental kills any chance of being likable. Only God's kindness displayed through us can do that. Being judgmental, being judgmental pushes people away from the Savior they desperately need. The kindness of God is what's intended to lead people to repentance. But to embody the kindness of God that has the potential to lead people to put their faith in Jesus, we must walk in the fullness of grace and truth just like Jesus. Let me tell you what. We are not responsible for people's decisions. We are not responsible for people's decisions. But we are, but but as Christ's ambassadors, we are responsible to embody the kindness of God that leads people to the hope, the truth, the peace, the forgiveness, the salvation found found through faith in Jesus by walking in the fullness of grace and truth. The question is, how in the world do we do that? And the answer is, I don't have a perfect answer. This is hard. This is very messy, which is why we haven't done a very good job at it. That being said, I do do believe there is one thing that we all need to stop and one thing that we all need to start in order to do this. First, stop judging people for that sin. Stop being judgmental making people who are not yet followers of Christ feel criticized, 
put down, excluded, or marginalized for that sin they're doing, whatever that sin may be. This is the grace Jesus showed the woman. This is the grace people need. Then let me ask you, why would we be judgmental toward people who don't know Jesus for a particular sin they're doing anyway? Why in the world would we do that? Is that one particular sin that they're doing keeping them separated from God in this life and in the next? Not according to Jesus. If they stop doing that one sin, but they never put their faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of their sins and leader of their life, would they be saved? If they stop doing that but never put their faith in Jesus, would they be saved? Not according to Jesus. It doesn't make any sense to be judgmental toward people who have never put their faith in Jesus because God's rules and his commands and his laws and his ways, whatever way you want to describe it, are not for them anyway. With God, relationship always precedes the rules. That was the case in the Old Testament. That was the case in the New Testament. God has never given a rule as a means for us to establish a saving relationship with him. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus alone. By asking Jesus to be the forgiver of our sins and the leader of our life alone. He, the, the, he has only ever given laws and commands and rules to people who are already in a saving relationship with him. And the reason he gives them to us are for our benefit and for his glory. Jesus is not interested in people's behavior modification. He is concerned with restoring and redeeming and reconciling our broken relationship with God. And then afterwards, after we turn by putting our faith in him, And following him, he's then concerned with transforming us into everything he's created us to be. That's why we need to put down our rocks and stop judging people for that sin. And instead, try to help lead them to the Savior they desperately need. That leads to what we need to start. Start pointing people to Jesus. The one truth people need to know is that they, like you and you and you and you and you and me, are in desperate need of a Savior. Not because of that specific sin, but because they, like you, are a sinner who has a broken relationship with their heavenly father. The one truth people need to know is, come on, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So stop judging people for that sin And start pointing them to the God who loves them, who is for them, who desires a relationship with them, and who proved that by sending Jesus to do for them, for me, and for you what we could not do for ourselves. And I can't today possibly tell you for all the ways for how to do that. But what I can tell you is it will require a relationship with them because influence happens within the context of relationship. What I can tell you is it will require an enormous amount of humility, not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. What I can tell you is the kindness of God is intended to lead us to repentance. And what I can tell you is being judgmental kills what only kindness can do. When I was 21 years old, um, I got married at 20, which is entirely too young for those of you who are 18 and 19. Uh, I was doing part-time, I was working part-time doing student ministry at a, at a church, a little small church, and at Youth for Christ in Lincoln. And, uh, you know, I'm married now, so I got to make more money than that. I made 
no money doing that, and so I needed to get another job. But my best friend from high school, Matt, worked at a donut shop, and I was a little heftier back then than I am now, and I thought, this is a fantastic idea, free donuts all day. And so I was like, and he told me they were, they were hiring, and I'm like, awesome, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply. Well, I had met the owner, Larry, before. Uh, he, we knew who he, he knew who I was, and I knew who he was. Um, and Larry set up an interview with me, and I was extraordinarily nervous going into that interview because the only thing I knew about Larry really was that he was agnostic and he was gay. And I'm like, if this guy finds out what I do for a job, there's no way he's going to hire me because he's going to think I'm, I, I guarantee he's been judged, felt judged for that before, and I, I don't, there's no way he's going to hire me if he finds out that I'm a follower of Christ. Well, had the interview. He didn't ask me what I did for a job, any of that stuff, anywhere else, and so I got the job. Well, over the time that I worked there, uh, Larry and I became extraordinarily good friends. And, you know, Matt and Larry and I, we all liked mountain biking, so we'd go mountain biking together. Just We became just really good friends, hung out all the time. Well, obviously, over time, Larry discovered that I was a follower of Christ because I talk about it all the time. And every once in a while, I was given an opportunity to preach at that little church I was the part-time youth pastor at. And don't be impressed by that. At 21 years old, there was like 80 total people in the church. Most of them were over 90, couldn't hear me anyway. <laughs> so I'd get a chance. To, and whenever I got a chance to preach, like, I'd invite Larry. Hey, Larry, you want to come? You want to come? You want to come? And, and he'd actually show up and come. I couldn't believe that he'd come and hear me preach. And then over the time I got done, we'd, we'd have so many spiritual conversations, and we'd talk about our spiritual journeys and all that stuff. And I just kept going, hey, Larry, dude, I, all I know is God loves me. He sent Jesus for me, and I believe God loves you, and he sent Jesus for you. And that's, I just kept that message on going over and over and over again because I didn't know what else to say except that. I just wanted to point him to Jesus. Well, I ended up having to quit that job, and the whole reason is because I, Chris and I were moving to Chicago, and I'll never forget one of the last things Larry said to me before I left. One of the last times I hung out with Larry, it still gets me choked up today, he said, Ronnie, you're one of the few Christians that I didn't feel judged by. And he said, because of that, this is so funny, he said, it's made me a little interested in Jesus. A little. And I'm like, cool, that's better than none. You know, like a little, like, man, I'm so glad I could be a part of that. But it was all because of one thing. I just wanted to point him to Jesus. Being judgmental kills what only kindness can do. Let me, ask you, let me ask you this final question. This is such an important question. Is it more important for you to judge people's sins, people who don't know Jesus, is it more important for you to judge their sins or to point people to Jesus? Because you'll do one or the other. I pray and hope it's more important for you to point people to Jesus. Because Jesus is who we are all in desperate need of. I want to say one last thing before I close in prayer. And this to those of you who would say you've never put your faith in Jesus, you would not call yourself a follower of Christ. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you tuned in. So glad you're joining us. I just, to wrap up, I just want to say I'm sorry. And I truly do want to apologize. If I or any other person who has claimed to be a follower of Christ has ever been judgmental towards you and has made you feel criticized, put down, excluded, or marginalized. I'm so sorry. I think all that God would want you to know today is for God so loved you That he sent Jesus for you as much as he did for me, someone who did not deserve that. Like me, you are in desperate need of a savior. And all you need to do to accept God's love for you and his forgiveness for you and his grace for you and his mercy for you and his salvation for you It's just put your faith in him and ask him to be the forgiver of your sins, your savior, leader of your life, your Lord, your God. And there is no pressure to do that today. There's never any pressure from us to do it. But if something is in you stirring, that you've never done that, you want to accept his love for you and his mercy for you and his salvation for you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. 
as I pray. Dear Lord, um, I pray those of us who are your followers, that we choose to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, your ambassadors, by just pointing people to you, Jesus, walking in the fullness of grace and truth like you did, Jesus, being kind. For every person who's never put their faith in Jesus but feels that they're stirring and prompting to do that today, right now where you're at, at home in this room, you can do that quietly right now where you are. You can just confess that <laughs> you were in desperate need of a Savior because of your violation of sin that broke the relationship against God, that broke your relationship with him. And right now you can declare that you believe Jesus is that Savior because of his death and resurrection from the cross, resurrection from the grave. And now in this moment, ask him to be your savior. Ask him to be the forgiver of your sins. And declare, Jesus, I wanna follow you as the leader of my life, as my Lord, as my God. Jesus, right now, as people are praying that prayer, I pray that your spirit just indwells within them, that they feel the love from you they've never felt, a grace from you they've never felt, uh, an assurance of their salvation from you in this moment. I pray you give that to them. In Jesus' name, amen.